I want you to imagine this morning that you lived in the first century. And living in the first century, you contracted the horrible, dreaded disease of leprosy. That you were one of those men that we read about in Luke chapter 17. You were one of those ten men who heard about Jesus and you heard that here was a man who could do miracles. Here was a man who was healing people of their diseases and you had leprosy. What would you do that day if you heard Jesus was coming to your town? Imagine you had leprosy. The most dreaded disease of Bible times. The most talked about uh, disease in all of the Bible. A disease that, that affected your, your entire body, but especially as when it affected you outwardly. Affected your flesh, affected your skin, and, and, and even your, your, your sub-tissues. It, you know, it started out as, as, these, as these sores that started underneath the skin and then came through and with, with these horrible sores on your skin and, and, they, and they left these, these horrible white scaly scabs all over you. Imagine having that kind of a disease that in that day and age you couldn't run down and get an antibiotic. You couldn't run down and get a shot and say, well, this is going to, in, in, in five days, this will be over with. Here was something that was most of the time a life sentence. And while it brought death eventually, it didn't bring it quickly. And there was pain and suffering for a long time. I want you to imagine the first century you had leprosy and you heard Jesus was coming to town. What would you do? You see, it wasn't only the physical trauma that it brought to these individuals. There was, there was the social side of this disease. There was the banishment that people had when they had leprosy. They, they weren't allowed to be around everybody else who didn't have leprosy. They were only around, allowed to be around other people who had leprosy. And so in the Old Testament, they were told to be put outside the camp. Every leper was to be put outside the camp. They couldn't come inside the camp. They couldn't come into the city. If they had leprosy and their family didn't, they couldn't even be around their family. I want you to imagine being a leper in that day and age. Being a leper who, who when, the, when, the priest, when the priest was the one who diagnosed you with having leprosy, you had to go outside the city, you had to tear your, your garment. You, and if anybody who didn't have leprosy came around, you had to cover your mouth, you had to cover your mouth, and you had to scream, unclean, unclean. You had to warn them of who you were and what you had. I want you to imagine you had leprosy. You heard Jesus was coming to your city. You knew what he had the power to do. What would you do? Would you have done the same thing that these ten men did in Luke chapter 17? Would you have run to find this man Jesus? And would you have cried out for him to do something to heal you? I want you to turn your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 17. And we're just going to investigate this passage today. I want us to use this passage to help us to, to understand what these men had, but not what they had. The, the, the mercy that the Lord had upon them in healing them of their leprosy. And what was it that transpired in their hearts, particularly the one man, after he was healed of his leprosy. I want you to not only imagine you had leprosy in the first century a dreaded disease with all of those physical traumas and those social uh, calamities that it brought. But I want you to imagine that Jesus healed you of your leprosy. What would you have done? You know the story perhaps, and if you don't, it was read, and we're going to investigate it this morning. Would you have been the one man, the one person, would you have been the lonely one who went back to Jesus to say thank you? Or would you have been like everybody else? Would you have followed the crowd and just say, no big whoop, I'll just keep going on my way so that I can get back with my family and friends and do whatever I want to do? What would you have done on that day? I want us to look in Luke chapter 17 this morning, and I want us to see what can we do to become more thankful in our lives. How thankful are you as an individual, as a person, as a Christian, as a father, a mother, a husband, a wife, as, as an employee, as a citizen of this country? How thankful are you? Is that one of the things that characterizes you as a person? 
What can we do this morning to say, help me to be more thankful? I want us to use this passage in Luke chapter 17 to teach us three things this morning that can help all of us to be more thankful. If you're already thankful enough, you can ignore this lesson. If you're already thankful enough, you can just check out and you say, man, I can't get any more thankful than I am. I'm just as maxed out as any human being can be on thankfulness. So I've perfected this. I can teach this lesson better than anybody else. So I'm just going to zone. And if that's you, just zone out. All right, you permit, just lay down on the pew and, and just get a pillow and cover up and take a nap if you're that person. But if you're like the rest of us, if you're like normal people, what can we do to be more thankful today? Look in Luke chapter 17. I become more thankful when I open my mind up. When I open my mind to know what God expects of me. I want to start at the end of this, of this account in Luke chapter 17. We're going to back up and look at the beginning of it. But since it's already been read, we're familiar with what happens here. And if I'm going to become more thankful, I need to open my mind to know what is it that God is wanting from me. Do you know that God expects us to be thankful? Do you know that? Do you know that God expects us to be grateful? When this one man came back, look at what Jesus says in verse 17. Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? What was Jesus saying about those nine? What was, it, what was it that he was expecting? What was it that he was wanting from them? What was it that he thought they should have done? He thought, he expected, he wanted them to be thankful for what had happened. When we look at this account, we don't just need to see one man who was thankful and nine who were not. We need to see what Jesus was wanting from those other nine. He wasn't just... Con he wasn't just calling them out publicly to shame them. He was saying, I expect people to be thankful. God expects us to be thankful for what he's done for us. Do we know that? You know, the Bible, in, in, in two passages in the New Testament, uses a Greek imperative, uses a, uh, an imperative com to command us. In Colossians 3 and verse 15, it says, Be thankful. It's not, it's not a suggestion. It's not a wish. In that verse, it's a command. Be thankful. When you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, giving thanks. Again, it's an imperative. It's a commandment of God. Do we understand that giving thanks is not something that's optional with God? It's not just a nice thing to do. It's not just a good idea if we do it. But it's actually a Christian duty. If you, were, if you were to take that terminology and you in your mind were to start listing out what you think are Christian duties, what would, what would you have put on your list of Christian duties? And I, I don't really like that terminology, but I want us to think about it for just a moment. Would you have put being thankful on that list? God commands us to do it. But I want to take this one step further. And this may make some of us have to think this through a little bit. If God commands us to be thankful, if God expects us to be thankful, then to be unthankful or to be ungrateful is actually a sin. Do we know that? Do we know that ingratitude, ingratitude, not expressing our thanks to God, the Bible indicates that's a sin. You say, wow, that's taking, it, that's taking it maybe a step too far. Well, if you look at the two passages that are on the screen, Romans chapter 1 and 2 Timothy chapter 3. In Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 20 and down, down through the end of the chapter, you have a listing at the end of the chapter especially of a number of various sins that God was putting all together to say these separate man from God. But as you back up to verse 20, God describes some individuals who had rejected God. That's what they had done. They had rejected God. They, they, they'd said, we don't want God to reign over us. We don't want him to be our God. We don't want to have anything to do with him. 
And he describes and he includes in that list those who were unthankful. Look at it in Romans chapter 1 and verse 21. Being unthankful in Romans chapter 1 is a sin. Just as much as everything else listed in Romans chapter 1 is a sin. When I get over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, God does a similar thing by listing a number of things by which separate us from God when we do them or, in this case, when we don't do them. There are certain sins we know, well, if I commit this act, it's going to separate me from God. But being ungrateful is when I don't do something that I know I need to do. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, there are those who are being self-centered, who are just focused in on self, and God includes in that list those who are unthankful, or your translation might say ungrateful. If I need to become more thankful, I want to start this morning by saying, in order to become more thankful, I need to open my mind to know God expects me to be thankful. He commands me to be thankful. And when I choose not to be thankful to God, I have sinned and separated myself from God. That may be stronger than you have ever thought about that particular topic. But I would challenge you to look at these passages and to see if that's not what the Bible says. When we're commanded to give thanks, James chapter 4 verse 17 says, To him who knows to do good. Would that include giving thanks? To him who knows to do good, James 4 verse 17, and does not do it. What does the rest of the verse say? To him it is sin. I know I'm supposed to give thanks and I don't do it. What's the fallout? I'm separated from God. So we could stop the lesson here, and we could just say, well, we need to become more thankful. How do we become more thankful? Open our minds to know God has commanded, okay, God commanded me to be more thankful. All right, I'll be more thankful. But this passage does so much more than just tell us this is what God expects. In order to become more thankful, I not only need to open my mind, I need to open my eyes. And I need to open my eyes to see what God has done. Go back up to verse 12. These ten men hear that Jesus is coming to their village. And verse 12 in Luke 17 says, Then as Jesus entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers. And what did they do? They stood afar off. Why did they do that? Because that's what they were supposed to do. You have leprosy, you can't stand a near you can't come a close. you got to stay afar. You can't come near us. Get away from us. They were standing afar. They lifted up their voices. Why did they do that? Because they weren't close. They had to yell. Not only to get Jesus' attention, but perhaps even to be heard. They couldn't come into the city. They were on the outside yelling for Jesus' attention. And they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Have you ever heard somebody calling your name and you kind of ignored them? Don't, 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 be careful how you answer that. I'm, that's just a, that's a hypothetical question. You ever heard somebody calling you? Uh, you, you, you heard, they, they were shouting your name and you just, you just kind of kept walking. Da, 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 I, I, I didn't hear, did you? I didn't hear anything. Could Jesus have pulled that number? These lepers and ten of them at that. These lepers saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Peter, did you hear? I didn't hear anything. John, I, no, I didn't hear anything either. And just keep right on going. Could Jesus have done that? Not the Jesus I know. Do we realize that Jesus did not say, I've got something better to do? That Jesus did not say, oh, are you kidding me? The, these stinking lepers keep coming? Oh, well, you know, when are they going to leave me alone? Do we realize how much God wants to be merciful toward us? Do we realize he wants to do that? It's not, it's not a burden to him. It's not a have to for him. Do we realize how much God wants to have? Look in verse, 12, look in verse 14. They lifted up their voices at the end of verse 13. Verse 14 says, when Jesus saw them. There's other verses that talk about when Jesus saw people. Uh, who, were, uh, who were full of disease, or when he saw people who were uh, living a life that was separated from God, that he had compassion on them. And that's exactly what happens here. Jesus sees them. 
And Jesus wants to have mercy on them. Over in Psalm 119, and verse 132, in this great chapter about God's Word, it says, Look upon me and have mercy as your custom is to those who love your name. God's custom is He wants to have mercy toward us. 2 Peter chapter 3 says God doesn't want anybody to perish. Jesus comes to this village. He doesn't want these lepers to perish from this physical ailment. But 2 Peter 3 verse 9 is God doesn't want us to perish from a spiritual ailment of sin. God wants to have mercy on us. Aren't you glad we serve a God who loves us? Aren't you glad we serve a God who just not only can have mercy on us, but He wants to have mercy on us. Jesus sees them. He hears them. He has compassion upon them. Aren't you glad we serve a God who not only wants to have mercy? What if God wanted to have mercy, but He wasn't able to have mercy on us? What if He loved us and wanted to have mercy and grace toward us, but, oh, well, I'm all tapped out. You know, I, I have to wait until Friday till I get some more grace and mercy in my bank account, and then, and then I'll see what I can do about you. Aren't you glad we're not waiting till Friday for God to get paid with some more grace and mercy to give to us? The Bible says that His grace is abundant. Think about Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14, where he says, The grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant towards me. How much grace did Paul need? Sometimes we think he needed more grace than we do. I'm not sure about that. But he said, The grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant abundant. Aren't you glad that there's enough grace for you and for me and for everybody in the whole world? God wants to extend to us His mercy. God wants to give us His grace, and His grace is overflowing in abundance to the point that Psalm 68 and verse 19, the Bible says that God deals to us, He, he, he daily gives us bountifully more than, we can, more than we can even handle. And even in some translations, Psalm 68, verse 19, talks about how He bears our burdens daily for us. Now take that and apply that to me, to you. How do we become more thankful? I need to open my eyes. And in order to become more thankful, I need to be observant. I need to look around and see what God is doing in my life. I need to open my... It, Psalm 34 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. What does the Lord being good look like? That's what that... And you could even ask in that verse, what does it taste like? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. What does that look like? I dare say every one of us know what that looks like. We know what the Lord being good to us looks like. How often are we looking for it? How observant are we in the Lord being good to us? Sometimes our attention is on the bad stuff that has happened in our lives and, and on the difficulties that we're having and, and on the challenges that come into our life. And sometimes our focus is so much on the negative side of that that we never taste and see that the Lord is good to us. These ten, these ten men come to Jesus. Lord, Master, Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus saw them. What does verse 14 say? Jesus saw them, and he said, Go, show yourselves to the priest. Why did he say that? Because that was, that was Jewish law. If you were healed of your leprosy, you had to go to the priest, and the priest had to pronounce you to be healed so that you could be back among society. And so it was as they went... They were cleansed. As they went, they were cleansed. Would they have been cleansed if they didn't go and do what Jesus said? I dare say they wouldn't have. But Jesus said, go and show yourself to the priest. And when Jesus said those words, they still had leprosy. But as they went, what happened to leprosy? It's gone. When they obeyed God, when they obeyed Jesus, what happened? He cleansed them. Not before, but when they're obeying Him, He cleanses them of their leprosy. Now what does verse 15 say? And one of them, when he, what? Saw that he was healed. Does it take a doctor for a leper to figure out that he doesn't have leprosy anymore? 
Does it take somebody who's been to medical school to figure out, oh, wait, my bones feel normal again. Oh, wait, look at my skin. My skin doesn't have those sores on it anymore. Oh, wait, I don't feel sick anymore. Oh, wait, how long would it take for a leper to realize, I, not that the leprosy is on its way out, that's not how Jesus healed. How long would it take for a leper to realize, I don't have one piece of leprosy left in my body? How long would it take for him to realize that? How long? You'd know it right away, wouldn't you? He knew it instantly. Remember when Naaman the leper in 2 Kings chapter 5, was, was, he dipped seven times in the Jordan River, came up the seventh time. Remember what the Bible says about his skin? It was like that of a little child. So it's not just that these guys' skin would have just gone back to like it was before they became a leper. Jesus gave them skin like a little child. It was perfect. How long? It didn't take them long. How long does it take us to see how good God has been to us? Here's this leper. He doesn't have leprosy anymore. Immediately he realizes what God has done for him. How observant are you and I every day to what God is doing in our lives? And as we are observant, let me add to that, that I need to be observant and then I need to make and keep a list of what I have observed. We sing the song, number 118 in your book, that says, we need to count our blessings and name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Is it easy to count them? It's a lot easier to count them when you write them down. When you start making a list and you start keeping a list of all that God has done for me in my life, and, 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 and how, how, how do I know I need to do that? Well, Psalm, 1, Psalm 103 and verse 2 says that we need to not forget all of his benefits. How can I not forget what God has done for me? I don't know about you, but I forget all sorts of stuff. You ever walk from one room to the other and you get to the other room and say, wow, this is a great room. <laughs> I guess I'll go back to that other room and try to remember why I came to this great room. How many times we forget things? You ever go out to your car to get something? You say, wow, this is a terrific car. Glad I've got it. I'm going to go back in the house, try to remember, why did I come out to the car? How do I not forget all of God's benefits? What if I wrote them down? What if I kept a list? What if I counted my blessings one by one? Do we do that? Have we done that? What sort of things would you put on your list? What sort of things would you put on your list of things to be thankful for? I, I, I really don't have time to go through all of what's on this sheet, and most of this is from something that, that this church, well, that, that a number of people helped to compile a few years ago. Are there any people in your life that you need to be thankful for? I'm, I didn't ask the other question. Don't think about the other people. Are there any people in your life that you need to be thankful for? Well, how, how, about, how about a few, and, and we won't take time to read all of these. Uh, how about God, Jesus, Holy Spirit? They're all persons. You read about them in the Bible. Are they important in our lives? How about family, babies, toddlers, teenagers, your children, your friends, your grandparents, your grandchildren? What about your church family? What about Christian families, Christian parents, Christian husbands and Christian wives? How about elders and their wives, deacons and their wives, preachers and their wives, missionaries and their wives, church secretaries, widows, elderly members, new Christians, those people who lead us in worship, those people who work behind the scenes at church, our co-workers, kind people, and I would even say even unkind people, good teachers, doctors, nurses, police, firefighters, EMS, people who serve our country. If you were to make a list of people, just people you need to thank God for. How long would your list be? If you just made a list of people to thank God for those people. Are there any things, any things that we need to thank God for? Thank God for the Bible, for the earth, for hugs and smiles, for hospitals, for modern medicine, for our country, for education, for jobs, for books, 
for food, for our homes, for our cars, for buses, for clean water, hot water, and cold water, for air conditioning and heaters, whatever heaters are, indoor plumbing and electricity, warm beds and pillows, music, sports, technology, computers, internet, our church website, and here's some for some of you, chocolate, pizza, and candy. What kind of things are you thank? If you were to make a, just a list of things, just a list of things to be thankful for, count your blessings. Name them one by one. What would be on your list? Are there any circumstances of life for which you need to be thankful? And the, this, these lists are so far from being exhaustive, it's not even funny. Thankful for life itself being created in the image of God, for time with family, for adoption, for the bond we have with Christians, for the opportunity to hear the gospel, know the gospel, obey the gospel, teach the gospel, to know great saints, for the good health that we have, for our healthy children, for freedom that we have in this country, for the abilities that we have to see, read, hear, listen, learn, think, and to choose, just for life. How many circumstances, we think about circumstances in our life, we say, I can't, I, I can't thank God for these circumstances, and maybe you can, but are there circumstances in your life you say, wow, look at, all the, look at all the good that is happening to me in my life. What if we made a list of circumstances in our life that we want to thank God for? Are there any spiritual blessings? Do we have any spiritual blessings? Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, all spiritual blessings are found in Christ. If you are in Christ, if you're a Christian, you've got every spiritual blessing that God has to, to, in, in His disposal to give to us. Anything to give, give, give thanks to God for? How about His unfailing and unending love? How about God's impartiality, His loyalty, His encouragement, His long-suffering toward us? How about God's providence, His unchanging nature, His trustworthiness? What about God's desire for us to be saved and His faithfulness to His promises? Is that a reason to give thanks to God? How about owning a Bible and the power of God's Word? How often do we thank God for the church? How about grace, mercy, forgiveness, faith, hope, and love? How about the inexpressible gift of Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus? What sort of spiritual blessings do we have to thank God for? How about salvation, the opportunity to repent, to be baptized, fellowship with God, have absolute truth? What about heaven? What about eternal life with God and with Jesus? What about the fact we have Jesus as our high priest and as our sympathizing Savior? What about the fact that God never takes a break? that He's watching over us 24-7, 365? What about the fact that we can know that we are saved? What about the fact that God gives us second chances and second chances and second chances? What about the fact that, we, yes, we do have challenges. Yes, we do have difficulties in life. Yes, we do have hard times. But do those help us to be thankful for the good times? Do, do, do those difficult times help us to remind us that what God is doing in our life to help us to work through and to walk through our, those things in our life? What about prayer? Are we thankful for prayer and the opportunity to, to come before God? What about the sanctity of marriage? What about Christian fellowship? What about the love of other Christians, the support of other Christians, the strength of other Christians? What about finding the church where you can worship wherever you go? What about the fact that God is still on the throne, that the blood of Jesus still cleanses us from our sins, and that you as a Christian are stronger than the devil? Is there anything as a Christian to be thankful for? Hello? What if you were just to make a list of your spiritual blessings? How long would that list be if you were just to make a list and to name it one by one? Ushers, if you want to go ahead and pass out the booklets uh, at this time, and uh, you all can see the booklets, but uh, uh, keep paying attention as the ushers come and pass them out. Those of you who are members of this church know that, but that for every month this year, we've been focusing in on 28 things that we can do, 28 days that we can spend uh, during the month to improve our walk with the Lord. We just finished the month of October, at least we are finishing, where we focused on 28 days to teach the gospel. And have had opportunities to do that, and hopefully we will continue to for, the, for every day ahead of us until the end of our lives. But what can we do in November? Is there a holiday in November that just kind of stands out to you? Um, you know, I've, I've, got, I've got a daughter who has a birthday in November, so that's a holiday that stands out to... But November is sometimes that month when we think about giving thanks more than we do other months. Does that mean we don't need to be thankful in the other months of the year? Absolutely not. 
nor does it mean we don't teach the gospel in any other month of the year other than October. But how about in November? What if we spent 28 days focusing in on becoming more thankful? Do we have anything as Christians to be thankful for? We've got more things to be thankful for than anybody on this earth. And so we need to make a list. And we need to keep a list. And so what this booklet's going to help us to do, and, and, and don't get buried in the booklet because we've got, more, we've got to finish this sermon today. But what this booklet's going to help us do is take 28 days in the next month to become more thankful to God for what He's done for us. And there's a place on every page of that booklet for you to list that day. Here are some things, here are some people, here are some circumstances, here are some spiritual blessings that I am thankful for today. And then down at the bottom of each page, there is a special thing to be thankful for that day, 28 different things for the month of November. And there's more than 28 things to be thankful for, but that's just one thing to focus on for that day among everything else that God has done. What would happen? What would happen to you? And I'm going to ask this about your family and about the church in just a minute. What would happen to you as a Christian if you spent 28 consecutive days being observant of the things we need to be thankful for and making and keeping a list of things that you are thankful for and that you, over 28 days, would that make you more thankful to God for what He's done for you? What about not just you? What, if you? what about your family? Would it make your family more thankful? What if every member of this church spent 28 consecutive days focusing in on what we're thankful for? What would that do for this congregation? Would that not make us more thankful as a body of His people? What better character trait can you have than to be known as somebody who's thankful? Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. The Bible says he broke the bread and he gave thanks. He took the cup and he gave thanks. Do we have it in our example of Jesus as one who was thankful? What can I do? What can you do? What can I do to become more thankful? Number one, open my mind. Know what God expects. He expects me to be thankful. Number two, Open my eyes. See, what is it that God is doing in my life that I need to be thankful for? But if that's all you do, if all we do is open our eyes and see it, if we're only observant and we only make a list, we have stopped way short. We're not done. Just opening our eyes and seeing, that's not it. We come back to Luke chapter 17. That is not what this man did. Were those other nine men thankful? Well, you would expect that they sort of might have been, right? I mean, you would have been glad if you looked down and you didn't have leprosy anymore. But did they do anything about it? If we are going to become more thankful, then we need to open my mouth. If I'm going to be more thankful, I need to open my mouth and express to God my humble gratitude. It's not enough to be observant. It's not enough just to have a list. I must open my mouth and tell my God how thankful I am. Come back to Luke 17, and we're going to be finished. Look in Luke chapter 17, verses 15 and 16. And here are four things that this one man did. Four things these other guys did not do. Were they thankful? We don't know. They weren't thankful in the way Jesus wanted them to be thankful. Four things this guy did we've got to do. Number one. I need to go to God. Look in verse 15. One of them, when he saw that he, was re, that he was healed, returned. Nine of them didn't go back to God. One of them did. What do I need to do in order to become more thankful? I need to open my mouth. I need to go to God. Not enough just to have a thankful heart. I need to go to God. What do I need to do? What does verse 16 say he did? He fell down on his face at his feet. I've got that circle in my Bible with the line drawn back up to verse 12 where it says they stood afar off. In verse 12, they're standing afar off, but where is this guy now? He's not standing afar off. He's not even standing. He's right there at the feet of Jesus having fallen down in his very presence. What do I need to do? I need to humble myself before God. 
You know, when we humble ourselves, we're going to be a whole lot more observant of what God's doing. When we humble ourselves, we're going to be a whole lot more expressive with our mouths and giving thanks to our God. Two things else that he did. He returned to God. He fell down on his face before him. Verse 15 says, And with a loud voice he glorified God. We're glorified there is in a present tense in the original language that means that he kept on, kept on. Kept. It wasn't just that he did it once and then he left. He kept on praising God. If I want to become more thankful, I need to open my mouth and constantly be praising my God, constantly be talking about how great my God is and tell others what my God has done for me. The, the, the expression here with a loud voice, did he think Jesus was hard of hearing? Did he think Jesus you know, wasn't going to be able to... He's right there at the feet of Jesus. Why is he doing it with a loud voice? He doesn't want just God to know. He doesn't want just Jesus to know how thankful he is. He wants everybody to know how wonderful God is. He's glorifying with a loud voice. The, the, loud, the word loud comes from the Greek word megas, and the word voice means comes from the Greek word phone. Put that together. Megas, phone. Guess what we get from that? Megaphone. When was the last time we used, figuratively, a megaphone? To praise our God. Are we doing it? Or are we shying away from it? How thankful are you for what God has done? Number four, he returns to God. He falls down before him. And with a loud voice, he praises him continually. And the fourth thing he does at the end of verse 15, or, or verse 16, is he is continually, again a present tense, giving thanks to him. He's not just praising him. He's not just telling him, here's how good you are. He is saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. What would you do if you had leprosy in the first century and Jesus came along and healed you? Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. Man, fist bump. I appreciate it. We'll, we'll catch up later. I, you know, I, I, I'll catch you. What would you do? You get on Facebook, like, love, you know, I'm happy about that. Are you going to shout it to the mountaintops what he's done for you? Are you going to say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you? You can't give God enough thanks for it, can you? When you make your list of things to be thankful for, when you make your list of people to be thankful for, circumstances to be thankful for, spiritual blessings to be thankful for, how much can we thank God for? Count your many blessings. You can try to name them one by one, but you won't be able to get to the end of the list. You won't be able to get to the end of this. Well, I've got everything on here. There's not a single other thing that I can add to this list. Because when we're observant, we'll see something else. The Bible tells us to be thankful. You read the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is full of praise and thanksgiving. Where it says, I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Or do we magnify him with thanksgiving? Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. Be thankful to him, are we? Are we thankful to him? Do we bless his name? The Bible is full of giving thanks. Psalm 95 and verse 2 says, Let us come before him, come into his presence with what? With thanksgiving. Do we come into his presence with requests and wants? Yes. But we come into his presence with thanksgiving, and we need to do it every day of our life, giving thanks unto our God. Psalm 105 if you read Psalm 105, 106, 107, and, and, and you go through, they all start the same way. Notice this on the screen. Psalm 105 and verse 1. First verse says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Look at Psalm 106 and verse 1. Psalm 106 and verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. One, Psalm 107 and verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Psalm 118, and you, see, you notice the difference between Psalm 107 and Psalm 118 and verse 1? Oh, give thanks to the Lord. To the Lord, for he is good. Psalm 136 and verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Psalm 136 and verse 2. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods. Oh, Psalm 136 and verse 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords. Last verse of that psalm says, Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven. Are we doing this? We read throughout the Bible. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. Remember how Psalm 107 verse 1 began? Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Guess what Psalm 107 does? Four times. Look at these verses, Psalm 107 and verse 8. Be this psalm began by saying, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Verse 8 says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. 
Got it? I don't think we got it. That's verse 8. Let's drop down to verse 15. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness. We got it? God doesn't think we've got it. Drop down to verse 21. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness. We've got it now, right? God says, I don't think you've quite got it. You drop down to verse 31. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness. We got it? How often, how much does God need to say, give thanks? We've got more to be thankful for on this earth than anybody else. And so it's not just one time here and there we need to do it. We need to be giving thanks always to Him in all things. Ephesians 5 and verse 20. Are you making a list of all of those things? We need to say, thank be to God. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift of Jesus. And the fact that He sent Jesus to die for us on the cross and give thanks for that every day of our life. Recognizing that through the death of Jesus, we are able to triumph that God leads us in that triumph every day of our life. And because of His grace, how thankful are you for the grace of God? That because of His grace, we're able to abound in thanksgiving. And Psalm, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57 says, Thanks be to God. He doesn't lead us into defeat. He gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. How did He do that? Jesus died, He was buried, and this whole chapter says He was raised from the dead for us. Thanks be to God for what He's done for us. Paul said, I thank Jesus for what He's done for me. He's enabled me. He's given me a task to do. And so these verses again, Corinthians, or Colossians 3, verse 15, be thankful. Two verses later, whatever you do in word or deed, give thanks. And then first, or Colossians 4 and verse 2 says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant with thanksgiving. Last verse. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18, in everything give thanks. How would our lives be enriched if we became more thankful for all things that God has done, is doing, and will do for us? May God help us to not just say, oh, that's a good thing to do. May God help us say, oh, that was a good lesson today. You know, we, we need to take it to heart. May God help us to get into his book, to open our eyes, to open our minds, and to open our mouths, and to tell God how great he is, and to thank him for all that he has done for us in our lives. If you want not just to become more thankful today, but you can become the most thankful today if you'll give your life to the Lord, if you'll obey him today, if you'll do what he told us to do in the Bible, told us to do in the New Testament in order to become one of his children, you can leave this place today full of thanksgiving. This man came back to Jesus because he was cleansed from his leprosy. And he said to Jesus, Thank you for cleansing me from my leprosy. I've got the best life possible now. Do you know how often the Bible sort of talks about sin being like leprosy. What happens when God takes away our sin? It's so much better than God taking away our leprosy. When I, through faith, do what God tells me to do, these men, Jesus said, go and do this, and as they were going, when they obeyed Him, they were cleansed. What do I need to do in order to be cleansed from my sin? Not my leprosy, from my sin. I need to believe that Jesus is God's Son. And believing that He's God's Son, I need to repent. I need to turn away from the wrong that's in my life. Make up my mind. I want to stop doing what's wrong. I want to start doing what's right. Turn my life in the direction of God. Confess my faith in Him and be baptized. To be immersed in water because that's what they did in the New Testament. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized, that person shall be saved. And if you've never done that, you, you can do that today. There's water here. There are garments here. There's towels here. You can have your sins washed away today, and you can leave here today rejoicing, giving thanks to God. He's taken your sins away. Walk with Him faithfully. That's what He calls upon us as His children to do, is to walk with Him in the light, serving Him every day, and that same blood of Jesus will keep washing our sins away. Are you a faithful Christian today? Do you have reason to give thanks to God today? 
for having removed every one of your sins. If not, we would encourage you to come and make your life right today as together we stand and sing.